You're with Pastor Troy right here. We're getting excited. We got a special program for you. You're going to be seeing over the next few weeks until we get ready for season two. You're going to be seeing the best of the On the Dock season one. These will be coming at you hard and steady. I want you to get them out there. Check them out. Help us get them out to your friends. We want to see you on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes as well. But this is the best of, get this, the best of season one. Get ready for it. We're going to be coming at you with a super season two coming up this August. We'll see you soon. Enjoy this episode of On the Dock season one. Best of. Pastor Troy, we're on the dock here. We're having a great time. Come join us on the dock.org. On the dock.org, we new releases every Tuesday and Thursday. Dr. Henna, I, do you know that song that we play? Our theme song is the old music to Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. You ever heard that song? That's the gold album up on the wall. It is my favorite secular song. Two minutes and 30 eight seconds long. It was written by him. And I don't know if you know this or not, but, but Mr. Otis Redding, uh, he was in studio. He recorded the song very short because he recorded the first verse. And when he got to the second verse, he whistled the second verse. He whistled the whole second verse. And then when they got done, he, he the producer said, what's up? And he said, uh, we got a gig to, in Detroit. They had to go up to Michigan, Detroit, somewhere up there. And they had to get on a plane. He said, I hadn't written the second verse. So he just whistled it. And he said, when we get back from the gig, we'll write the second verse. And so what happened was they died in an airplane crash. Didn't make it back. And what we were left with was the studio version, two minutes, 38 seconds long with the whistled verse of the second verse. So I love the song. It's one of my favorite songs. You know, I'm a Memphis boy. Georgia docks are great, but I always think of the Memphis docks of the Mississippi and stuff. So when I think about this song, it gives me great joy because one of the first things I'm going to ask God when I get into heaven is, can I hear verse two from Otis? <laughs> I want to know it. So I just wanted to tell you where we got the song from. Hey, On the Dock's all about conversations to propel your faith out of the shallows and into the deep. We're glad you're joining us. We're available. On the Dock is available at YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, Roku, Rumble, and SermonNet. Download that SermonNet app. It's a great app. If you're on Roku TV, you have to actually download the SermonNet app there and look up On the Dock with Pastor Troy. You can find us also on social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, um, and Getter. I think Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, Twitter, and, and Getter. I I got five now. I got to get all those down in my mind better. And when you find us, would you please hit subscribe, share with the other friends, hit like, notify, give us some comments. We love to talk with you. We'd love to have you as our Patreon partner or sponsor. We have multi tiers available for you to check that out. Go to go to our Patreon site and check out the tiers and partners uh, program there we have for you. It's pretty cool. We'd love to have you. And then finally, if you can't find us, go to onthedoc.org. We have an embedded viewer. We also have links there to all those different platforms, links to all of our social media sites, and you can always email us at info at on the doc.org. We're ready to go with a great program here. I got Mother Beth in the studio. Hi, Mother Beth. Hi, Annie. You were quiet in the first podcast. You got to talk more this time. I'm quiet. She's very quiet. She's <laughs> going to talk more this time. She is a mother of the church. And uh, we've had a we've had a church day here. We're excited, so, but we're glad to have you here. You look great. I'm a good listener. You're a good listener. <laughs> and Dr. Hannah is fun to listen to. So yes. uh, we're in the studio. We got incredible guests. We are doing an incredible, incredible series here. We're in part two right now of a series with called Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia series with Dr. Chris Hanna. Today, we're going to be talking about Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia's work with the Hands of Hope Foundation. That's our foundation that Mother Beth and I found here in USA, we do medical surgical uh, crusade teams, but mostly when we work with Dr. Hannah, we're doing med surge teams. So we've worked with her for years now, years, years, seeing her work just grow and blossom. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in this episode and uh, we're going to go from there. It's going to be good. So Dr. Hannah, Dr. Chris Hanna, welcome again to On the Dock. Thank you. All right, Chris. Chris has been traveling. She's ready to go. I wanted to ask her a question. If you didn't get a chance to see the first episode, we really laid out the basics uh, to Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. We're going to get much deeper into Chris's story in our next couple episodes. You're going to not want to miss it. You're going to want to get three cups of coffee and sit down and just chill for a while because she's got incredibly powerful witness and testimony. We're going to get into that. But we want to talk about how we got connected in this episode so you can see why I want you to know all this this incredible woman of God. Uh, but she's a, she's a medical doctor. 
Uh, what would be your specialty? Is it family practice? Is it general medicine? General, general public med- health. General medicine, public health. She is not just a doctor. She is a a leader, a leader amongst leaders. Uh, she is able to speak across all lines of bureaucracy and and social systems, and she's greatly respected. I've never seen anybody that could she could pull community together better than she does. She's definitely a community leader and she loves Margaret County and Kakata. And I say that as a Paramount chief of Margaret County, she is deeply loved in that County and nobody loves the children of Margaret better than uh, Dr. Chris. And I, I can see that when you go to her clinic, you can just see that. And, and not just, just the people, the staff you have, how many staff people do you have in that clinic now in, yeah, in your team? 36 now. 36. And yeah. what a happy staff worship together. They eat together. They fellowship together. It is a, I, I would, I, I would almost consider it. If you were a ship, uh, like a ship going through the sea, doing great, great things for God. It's like a ship. It's a well-oiled ship. The, 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 the facility, if you go back in the first uh, video, we showed a clip that included pictures of our modern clinic today. We've worked in there. Uh, just incredible. The place is just wonderfully cared for the team is tight they have their own person cooking they're they're caring for each other and then they're they're able to out of that abundance of love and joy they're able to care for patients at an extraordinary level i can walk through I, i've walked through <laughs> the best hospitals in that country i don't say best but the biggest you know like jfk i've walked through other places rainy in the day and you can see people you can see medical providers doing good work you can tell they love god but you, you don't see the care factor of the institution maximized anything anywhere near what I see when I walk in your place. Mm-hmm. And I think that is nothing could be rebuilding Liberia better than the lighthouse that you've put together at the Waterfield Primary Health uh, Care Clinic. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Just Thank amazing. You. And that light starts with you. It, it does because you, you, you've got this beautiful clinic, guys, state-of-the-art generator, state-of-the-art facility. But let me just show you this, guys. Her first clinic when she went back from Kazakhstan, when she got came back from Russia from her training, that was her first clinic. So it, it doesn't have to do with build beautiful blocks. It has to do with a beautiful mind and a beautiful mission and a beautiful vision and a beautiful commitment to the people. And she will work with whatever she has, trust me. Mm-hmm. If you, and, and if you give her five of something and you send it to her, she will see that five were received and five was used and she'll let you know how five five people were helped. That's what I think the trick and the magic and the, and the, the godliness is to her, her deal is stewardship and gift and, and, and awareness. I've never seen people, somebody that handles uh, uh, what she receives from people with such a treasure. And you do an extraordinary work of that, Dr. Anna. I've seen that over and over again. Just, just when we transfer drugs or when we transfer something to her, the stewardship is incredible. Her people are incredible. And I really appreciate that. And Amen. we all think that seems normal. But Dr. Hennig could tell you that's a very difficult thing in Liberia because the system there has not been organized like that for years. And so she's having to rebuild the concept of a family and, and working together in community. And although she's a community healthcare provider, she's, she, she's not just trying to go out in the community to do it. She's built community right around her. And it, it's like a lighthouse. So you, you can see her clinics just, like I said, just absolutely absolutely amazing when we land there I, i'll come back to this in a second let me let me back up one more thing i want to ask you COVID 19. COVID hit us we were ready to get ready to start doing our 2020 trip we should be doing a 2021 trip we should have done one in march we didn't we should be planning to do one in february 2022 march 2022 i don't think we'll be doing one yet you did tell me a few teams small teams are starting to come back in even one from the us what what is COVID 19 and how has it impacted over the last two years, Liberia? Uh, has it been devastating? How have you managed it? Just give us a little bit of an overview. Well, uh, COVID-19, actually, as compared to Ebola. Which you had had just previously to had, this. Yeah. <laughs> and so Ebola, in my opinion, was more devastating than COVID-19. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, we lost uh, families uh, during Ebola, just families and families and families. So f- f- for the record, Ebola uh, hit their country so hard. It, one of the worst countries. There, it was there, Guyana a little bit. And uh, where's the other country? It was in Guinea. Guinea, Guinea. Just then, devastated Liberia, devastated. Yeah. And people need to understand, it, uh, Ebola can be 80 to 90 to 95% fatal, correct? Very, very, is it very, it's very high yeah. before some very of the treatment, high. very high. Like, like it, there's four of us in the room here. And if, if Ebola were to hit this room and wasn't treated by modern medicine, uh, 
we would probably lose all of us here. All of us. Three to, at least three of us would be gone. But but the, the stats say if there were 10 of us in here, there'd be nine gone. Eight to nine would be gone. And you understand, yeah. devast- and, it, and, and, and Ebola didn't discriminate. It, it kills children. It killed adults. It killed old people, young people, right? Pretty much oh. everybody. COVID-19 has been a little different because the, the death rate there is way less than 1%. Yeah. Um, and it's mostly among elderly people, immunocompromised people, not amongst the children, not amongst the, it, you see some cases of it, but, but in general, so for, for Liberians, malaria would be far more devastating that you deal with every day. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, typhoid, much more devastating typhoid, typhoid much yeah. more. So, so, and, and you guys just came out of Ebola. So you're prepared to use very strong health factors to protect yourself. You're almost better off than we are in this country at dealing with a dangerous disease because you have learned how to live differently. So, so mm. you, you sell COVID come, I'm sure it impacted people, but I guess more or less, maybe the greater impact was keeping us from coming to you. Partnerships. Yeah, and uh, COVID actually um, uh, taught us a different lesson because uh, during Ebola, we saw how families mm-hmm. died. Uh, COVID, uh, people looked at it a little differently. Uh, they were initially very terrified that something worse than Ebola had come. They thought of it like an Ebola was coming? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then after that, when the government uh, imposed that you go to work from the morning to 3 o'clock, uh, that changed a little because the question was, why should the virus be asleep between morning to three? <laughs> and then after three o'clock, everybody needs to be off the street and they need to be at home. We did uh-huh. the same thing so here. <laughs> that was where the confusion came from. And they said, well, if that's the case, then we'll just go out. Right. Yes. Yeah. We didn't. They didn't believe. Well, let anything. me say this to you. Right. The Liberians are quicker on the draw than Americans because what we did in America is we sent our kids to school and they would go. They would say we will only bring the kids to school for half a day. So they would. They, you get the kid up. You send the kid on the bus. They they got to get up at six thirty. They got to get dressed. You got to fight them to get the clothes on. They're out the door at eight o'clock. And you turn around. They're getting back on the bus at eleven thirty, twelve o'clock, and they're coming home. And they've been at school a whole three hours. What did they learn? Nothing. They said all their classes were condensed. They spent most of the time walking from class to class. And 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 basically, we were sending kids for a half a day, and they were getting not even half an education. And so it was like, okay, you got the room clean. They're there. Let them stay and learn, you know? And we did a lot of things like that. I don't think that made sense. They didn't. And so quickly <laughs> they adjusted yeah. themselves. And in that process, I think that where we lost some people. Yeah. Because they just they totally overlooked. They got rid of what they need to focus on, hand washing, covering your mouth, social distancing, things like yeah. that would protect you. Uh, but once you've gone to a place and been there, like this, this table, if all of us had a COVID, it's here at three o'clock or four o'clock, it would still be here. So once you're here, you're here. But but then if you start just abandoning all reason, then like you said, you can be susceptible. So, so. I, you think bad, you think bad leadership and coaching on what to do kind of caused people to yeah, be skeptical. I think, I think the messaging was, was bad. Was, was bad. bad. Yeah, I agree. It was very I agree. Bad. But, and I think very people, bad. I think people here. Let me be honest with you. I think people here, Ebola in you in, in Liberia had a mental impact still on us here. And so when people saw COVID-19 coming, I think people here expected COVID-19. So people in our church, our community would be terrified. Like, man, this is horrible. And I'd look at them and go, guys, this is nothing like Ebola. And you know, this, you know, we would all be in this room. We said we would all be dead, you know, if we got it, uh, COVID hits this room. I mean, everybody in this room is pretty healthy. I mean, we might have little issues. Most of us could fight it off, fight it off easy. We, I got pretty sick uh, with it, uh, Chris. I got COVID. I had a hard time breathing for a couple of weeks, but I fought it off, you know. You know, I got through it, and and I didn't get to the hospital level. And we, we did lose people, no question, but we lose people to the flu. We lose people to other things every year. And and we we all thought it was COVID, uh, Ebola, but it ended up not being Ebola. And we really, really hurt a lot of things doing it. Oh, the, I'm not saying an overreaction, but... We, I think we closed and stopped the wrong things. And then as a result, it shut off the flow of supplies to uh, through NGOs and organizations to countries like yours. Mm-hmm. So uh, much. How, how much, 
how much did things cut off like rice from from China or, or products from India or products from the United States or just groups like ours coming? What what did you see in the impact of NGOs and, and organizations to well, Liberia? Most uh, NGO did not function mm -hmm. because uh, they had to leave either going back to the countries where they were from. Or and they were ordered back by their own countries. Yeah, they had yeah. to go back. The peace calls that they had had to come back home. They, um, other international organizations that were there, uh, they had to call for the people. And uh, that impacted us. Uh, the cost of goods? Yeah, the, the shipment of rice, because we have to import rice. Uh, the ships could not come in. And so rice, when they finally came on the market, it was so expensive that uh, the government had to intervene again that the price of rice could not go above. So they had to put cost amount. controls on yes, it. Yes, they yeah. had to put that on it. And Did, uh, fuel, get, did fuel get difficult to find as uh, well? Few, yes. Uh, Medications, times, fuel. Yeah, yeah. You have uh, none. Even though you had them selling it in little bottles and things on the sidewalks, but uh, yeah, they came back and uh, then schools were closed mm -hmm. uh, and uh, churches were for a couple weeks shut down. A month. Same yeah, here for down. months and months here. Yeah, there were churches then, that were shut down here for over a year. Uh, the Christians took to the airwave and uh, spoke against it, and the government decided to open it again and decided you could have distances in how you set up your chairs. Uh, mm. So that was open again. Uh, the universities uh, were closed down for a long time. Government offices, they had to uh, bring in workers uh, this week, this group works, and the next week, the stay off and yep. the other week, uh, they come in. Do, so do you find things are recovering now? Is is it closer back oh, to normal? Yeah, it's uh, it's close. It's it's normal again. That it's normal lasted, again. yeah, for the first year, but the well, second. We're not a hundred. We're still not a hundred percent normal here, but we're much closer. Mm. I think I think we were slower in returning because yeah. people are just. I mean, the, it's just they're just scared. There's a fear, and I thought I I have to say as a pastor and a spiritual leader, <laughs> God forbid that we ever get an Ebola here if the panic that we had over a serious disease, over a serious, serious virus, serious flu, I can't imagine if we got something like Liberia dealt with, with Ebola. I, I just want to say this, the Liberia people are a much tougher people than our people. And they're much more, um, I, I just able to withstand greater things. I, we co almost collapsed as a nation over this and God forbid we would get something that would kill in the 90, 95% level. I can't imagine how people would treat each other. Um, I mean, it's, so it's very, very thing. Well, I've gotten a privilege over the last few years for a while now, uh, to work with Dr. Henry. She's came back to the Kakata regions. We began to connect with her and I, I just want to show, we, we, I, I showed, I showed, let me back up one. I showed her first clinic in 2012 and she was getting back 2011, 2011. You said this was. Uh, no, 2012, 20, 2012, 2012, she's doing her first clinic in Kakata. Uh, this is our, our first clinic in Kakata around 2011. We were doing a medical clinic and people heard we were coming up in Wayla, which is also in Marguerite County, a little farther in than where she's at about 30 kilometers or so, I guess. Was that, what is it? Was Wayla yeah, about, 30, about. about 30 kilometers back in the day? It was a very bad road. So it took, could take an hour to get there. An hour and a half. Now you can get there in 15, 20 minutes. Uh, they have nicer roads now. Um, and w back in the day when we got to know Dr. Henna, we began to coordinate and working more and more with her. And you can see a great picture here. Uh, there's three pictures here. Uh, one is myself in that fabulous, no greater love hat, uh, from my mentor's ministry, Fred Bishops. And I've got my African shirt on. Actually, that's my African shirt. That's from, listen, that's from Dr. Okimi Amana. It was a gift of mine from South Africa, from the world cup. That's a world cup soccer shirt from <laughs> some from South Africa and with Dr. Jeff Parks and Dr. Sherry Parks. Uh, they're both with us on our team there. Dr. Henna, they're in Kakata outside the Esso station uh, where we would always stop in those days. So get a chance to greet her and meet her. This was very early in us getting to know Dr. Henna and it was just amazing what God did. You can also see some pictures here of our team. Now our team right now, the upper level, the upper pictures are specifically at the water field 
clinic, the primary health care clinic, your facility. So it's not any longer just a drawing. It's an incredible facility. Uh, Elizabeth Parks up there on the right, one of our PAs that travels with us, also in the middle, and also Dr. Jeff Parks, who's the medical director for the Hands Hope Foundation. We're all there in country doing clinic with you. Uh, our experience of doing clinic with you, what have you, as we've worked together with you over the last several years, um, how is the impact of teams coming in, whether it's from Texas or whether it's a team like ours coming in from Illinois. Um, what is, the, what is the impact on those teams? Do they, do they, do they, do they make your work better or we make your work more miserable? We come no, in and wear no, you no. out or what? No, I think, uh, it has been a really a blessing for us because our local staff do learn a lot from that experience. Uh, so the nurse that's working with Elizabeth should yeah. get a chance to exchange ideas. They'll get yeah. a chance to learn from each yeah. other. She's a PA. She's a PA. Yeah. And, and with Elizabeth being a PA, yeah. they can actually work so together. They work together very well. And, and, uh, and for Elizabeth too, she's going to be asked to identify things that she may not see here as much. Mm -hmm. So having her experience there will help as well. But then Elizabeth may have better knowledge on certain treatments uh, that are available. And then together, it really lifts the healthcare totally. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Parks has been working with you for a long time. Yeah, so it's not a it's not a curse. So it's, no, it's, it's a, a good thing. it's a good thing. Well, it's you know, we, we come in and we come in with yeah. large. You see, let me show you a picture, guys. I'll show you a picture here real quick. I'll come back to one. That's a picture of our team from 2019 coming in, and we have pretty good sized teams uh, that come in with us and Pro Health uh, International will come in and do work. And 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 man, we just we, we'll do as many cases as we can. We'll do clinic, eye cases, medical cases. We do them. We do them at her clinic. We do clinical at her clinic. We work down at a facility we built in Weyla, a surgical center as well. And just working together, we're able to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients, all of which Dr. Hen has been gracious enough to help us kind of pre-qualify and, and select and, 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 and do the proper triage. You know, back in the day, let me go back to the picture. Before Dr. Hannah, let me show you that before. Doc, this is before Dr. Henna. We just had people flog us. Uh, after Dr. Hanna, we got very organized, and I'll give you an example. This picture in the bottom left is Dr. Kim Miyamana with his cue for the eye clinic. Everything's organized now. <laughs> now, because of Dr. Hanna and her incredible team, they do such a good job getting good, difficult cases. You see the lower right, you see Dr. Amana passed out. <laughs> That's Dr. Amana because Dr. Hina has so many people ready to go for surgery that she takes every bit of from him and then he just passes out. You, you like that, Dr. Th That's the value of having you there. You know how to put people, who needs to be there, who needs to be treated now. You, you get that priority right. So your whole life seems about prioritization. You, you've decided we're gonna work with the women and children. Then, then you kind of take a look at who needs to be uh, put in the queue next. Is that a constant decision of yours of figuring out how to take scarce resources and yeah, deal? We worked on it during the whole year because we not only work with your team, we also have to work in the villages. Yeah. And so we constantly have to think about resources, how we're going to put the resources together for what village, how we're going to organize what's going to be when we get to the villages. Mm -hmm. So it has helped me in the bigger picture of things. Yeah, that's great. When the people come in. Well, when we go there, let me just say, I'll show a couple of other pictures just real quick. Here, here's a picture of Dr. Henna. A few years ago, she gave us an incredible uh, Pavla hut, right? I, we have that hanging up here in the walls of Community Faith Church near our Hands of Hope offices here. It, we've got another one from a previous year that far in the far. I'll show you one in a minute. But that, that's our team there working below. Dr. Uh, Dr. Manas below there, Dr. Parks, and Dr. Henna there on site running the clinic. She has a backpack on because because her clinic is on the move. She's got all these people queued up, and she's always in the move, ready to run it. And she she runs a tight ship, I'm just telling you. We've got this lovely picture here. This is the most recent trip, and we took her your beautiful uh, gift that you gave to us. And that lower left is hanging on the wall here. We have it with the tr full team, and we just memorialize our trips to you. Yeah, that's a typical. Uh, village. That's how you find the people in the villages. That's how it is. That, yeah, that is, and guys, things, people. Yeah. That's how it is. I mean, you'll yeah, see people walking down the street carrying their stuff. With those things on the. And, and the thing is, they're not just walking a few feet. They've walked from the village someplace else a while with it. You know, uh, and I love the clinic sign below Waterfield Primary Healthcare Clinic. Tell us about your clinic a little bit. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know. What, what got you there? What are, you, what are your primary goals and what you're seeing, what you're doing today? Well, we started off from the first uh, picture that you saw, the first clinic, we had nothing. I'm gonna bring that back up uh, for everybody to see. There you go, we started here. Yeah, but we desire to have something different. 
so that we could have more services to the people. Mm-hmm. And then we uh, went through the plans and got others involved in it and started raising funds for that. And God was gracious to us. He provided the funds, and we were able to construct that. Amazing. And uh, we constructed it during Ebola. Dude, I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, Ebola, we did not stop our work. We nope. brought buckets where workers could wash their hands mm-hmm. and told them how to take care of themselves and uh, never stopped a day. Wow. We continue to you, work. You know, one of the things that's year. amazing, did wow. your people stay pretty well during Ebola? Yes, they did. And so we uh, we did not lose any at our clinic. We did wow. not lose wow. any that's that was amazing. associated I, with our work. I want to say um, the same thing with us, Hands Hope Foundation. We were working with her through that. I was in the country um, when we were doing the outreach. Ebola hit, what was it, 14 or 15? Uh, 14. 14, okay. Mm-hmm. Ebola hit 14. It hit while we were doing mm-hmm. our surgical outreach. Mm-hmm. I was in the country. We had been there for, we had a double team that had come. They'd been there two weeks. We had another team that came in for two weeks. It was the largest team we'd ever taken. To, and I had been there for over a month. I went in a week early. Mm-hmm. I'd been there for two weeks. I think I was approaching five weeks. And, and right toward the end of the trip, my second group is there. I had the New York group and some of our people. Then I had another group right toward the end of it. Ebola was in Guyana. We were hearing about it and it began to be talked about while we were there. And we thought, well, it came across from Guinea, 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 Guinea. 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 It was in Guinea. Yeah. It came across over into what, what is the, what is the school? Lofa. Lo- it came into Lofa. Lofa, but what's the, what, where do we have up there? The, we got the medical school where, where the nurses go. We're, uh, Phoebe. Phoebe. It came to Phoebe. Mm-hmm. It, we, we knew it came across there. It came into the Methodist uh, uh, facility up there as well. We heard about that. And then I thought, man, we are on the road to Monrovia. Everything moves from Guinea to Monrovia. That is the trade corridor there. And we, we were finishing up our clinic and we were taking the team to go out and I was supposed to fly out with the team. And we just heard that Ebola had come on a motorcycle <laughs> and a taxi and a motorcycle had come into Monrovia. Somebody had come that had been found with it and was being brought in there. They, they, you know, Cause people ride on the back of a motorcycle, they ride in the taxi, they ride in the bus. And, and let me tell you, they cram in those buses. You can put more people in those buses. You can imagine taxi cabs in there, people get on the motorbike and then they ride for hours on bad roads. And everybody's sweating and hot because it's hot and dry and hot and wet. So an Ebola transfers through sweat or through perspiration. <laughs> and you just cannot get in a taxi or a bus or get on a motorbike and hold hold somebody for five hours and not transfer stuff. So you just know as that Ebola came up that road, many people would begin to be carriers of it and it would begin to leave a footprint. We were leaving as the first one. I have a paper where it says Mon- Ebola's in Monrovia. I'm still in Monrovia. And I'm getting ready to leave. And I get a call from uh, President Johnson Sirleaf office and said, could I come and meet with her? We were just finishing up our outreach and I get a call to meet with the president along with our Bishop of the Methodist church. Then and he says, Ma wants to see you. I thought, great. I remember calling home, Dr. Henna. I called home. I, did I cry to you? Mm-hmm, I cried. I cried a little bit. I cried out of sadness. It's not that I didn't want to meet, uh, Beautiful president. I've been wanting to meet her for years. I was exhausted for five weeks of outreach. I've been away from my family for five weeks. And she wanted to meet with me on the next t- on Tuesday, three days later, meaning I had to cancel my airline ticket and go meet with the president. Because when the president calls you and you're, I just become a Paramount chief, I thought, you got to go, you know. And so I called and said, I, I can't go. I want to go home. I want to get on the plane. I'm tired of this place. Ebola's here, you know. And then my, my spiritual mentor, Fred Bishop, called me. We talked. And he says, you can't miss this opportunity. You got to stay. I said, okay, I'll stay. So I stayed and met with her. It was one of the highlights of my life. And, uh, and all she asked me is how can hands of hope help the people of Liberia through what we're fixing to face. And it was in that meeting where we pledged to send as much medical resources as we could. And we sent over the next year, five containers plus a sixth one in the previous year, we sent six containers of medical supply and food and emergency provisions. And uh, we never closed our clinic. We never closed our facility. Not one of our Hope Scholars, not one of our students, not one of our nurses, not one of our people. Of We had 300 students under our scholarship program at that time. Not one person died or got, got, got Ebola and got sick. Well, we had a very close call on our way from uh, Wiala that same 
trip you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And on the way, we met a group of people there. It was just chaos, so we slowed down, and there was a sick patient that was there. And so we, like we always do, we just went, picked her up, and put her in our car, mm -hmm. and took her to see Ishrini Hospital. Wow. And oh. then when we got there, we heard the news of uh, Ebola, oh. how the nurses had already uh, contracted the disease, and they were... And uh, C.H. Rainey lost many people. Yeah, they, they, lost, lost many. they lost many people. Yeah. And so it was just like, Lord... The Lord, the Lord had his hand on you. The Lord had his hand on us. And I'm not forsaking the others, but I want to thank God for watching over your team, yeah. us doing good work. And that was a devastating disease. So just hear this. Number one is God watches over his. And, and if you have to go through it, God can be with you through it. And it's just amazing to see what it did. Uh, Dr. Hannah, just, just help us understand a little bit. Uh, when, when teams come in, when, when they, what kind of expertise, what kind of medical people, if, if people are looking to do short-term missionary work, long-term missionary work, what are the kind of medical people that would be helpful coming to Healthy Women Healthy Library? They say, I would like to come and give three months. I, I've retired. I'd like to practice. What are some things that you that, that, that you see that would be very helpful? Well, uh, we see the urgent need for surgeons. Surgeons, big time. And then the second thing for OBGYN. Uh, because that's the area now since the mothers of the country are the 13, 14, 15 years old yeah. girls. Yeah. And so we uh needing that. And that's why uh, in 2020, we went ahead and designed the structure, the physical structure. To do a surgical center. To do the surgical center and the uh, maternity department. How far along are you in that process of looking uh, at that? We designed it, got the estimates and everything, and uh, God has just blessed us. And uh, so we now have the full amount that Praise we need. God. And we're going to start the construction in February. Praise God. Well, see, see, that's why Hands Hope's not been back yet. We're waiting to come and be a part of that surgical yeah. facility. It's been a dream of yours and ours that we could do more and more. Let me let me say this to you. If you're out there and you're a surgeon, you're a retired surgeon, and your skill set's still good, you're good to go, the, the, the need for hernia, just basic hernias, mm -hmm. is beyond what you can imagine. Hydrocele, beyond what you can imagine. Um, OBGYN, we took an OBGYN on a couple trips with us, and they came and got him from the clinic, took him to the hospital, and we never saw him again. He, we basically picked him up on the way to, we, we dropped him off for an, the moment they heard OBGYN was in the country, they took him to Rainey for an emergency. And we, I think we got him before we got on the plane to leave. He stayed there nonstop. He did, he did, he did cases. He did uh, hysterectomies on, on, I, I, I saw pictures of endometriosis where what was removed from the uterus, the balls, the sacks were the size of softballs. And there would be like a bag of softballs. The, the, the women, the fibers would look like the women were pregnant eight months with those. And so that surgeon did emergency deliveries. He did cases. He did amazing things. So if you're OBGYN, if you are a surgeon, let me say this on behalf of that. If you are a pediatric surgeon, one of the biggest problems there is we take a lot of surgeons, but our American surgeons are often very uncomfortable working on smaller children. And so we really have to kind of work hard to get our surgeons to kind of go down and do some 10, 11, even 10, 11 year olds they don't want to do because we're very segregated here. You know what I mean? You know, they don't do pediatrics. If you're a pediatric surgeon, you are highly needed there. Now in all cases, they have surgical theaters, they have a few surgical theaters that look more like ours here, but just go back to the sixties or seventies with, uh, with primarily with uh, uh, ketamine and, and basic, uh, basic, real basic anesthesia. That's what we practice with mostly there. We do some full cases. You can arrange some of those. Are you hoping in your surgical center to be able to do a general case down the road? Oh, yes. Very uh -huh. much so. Yeah, that's what, it, that's what it's that's for. The, that's the real goal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But right now, there's so much you can do. And then, if so if you've got, if you've got any kind of surgical skill, um, if you are a plastic surgeon, there are so many cases of burns and and, yeah. and, 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 and and things that need to be worked on there that are tremendous. ENTs, 
an ENT would be tremendous. So if you have those skill sets, a dentist. Feel, a dentist. A dentist. <laughs> if you, we took a, we took dentist teams for pro health, and and I mean they did just we never saw them either. Mm -hmm. uh, just unbelievable. So so if you've got dental skills, eye skill, ophthalmology skills, optoma, optometry skills. Um, you are needed. Reach out to Hands of Hope Foundation, hohfoundation.org. Reach out to Healthy Women Liberia and let them talk to you about getting involved. If you want to reach out to us at uh, onthedoc.org, we'll, hopefully we'll get a Hands of Hope Foundation trip going again in 2022, hopefully maybe, but we'll, we will have one soon in the future. And if not, we'll get you connected with Chris and figure out how to get you. It's easier right now to get an individual or a small group over there mm -hmm. than it is to take a team of 30 to 60. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So, I think we're going to see some. I think what we're planning on this end, Chris, is probably bringing a ten of ten of a team of ten over okay. for a first trip, and just begin to do some cases again, and then get ready for the next phase. Okay. So we really want people to look at that. If you've got those skill sets, uh, if you're a nurse, you're a scrub nurse, uh, if you're a PA a nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. you would be welcome to come, and we would be glad to work with you. Reach out to us. Uh, there's just so much need there. Chris, what would you say as, as we kind of kind of take a look at this episode? Our goal in this episode is how you can partner with Hands Hope to work with you. A anybody out there hearing this can get a hold of us through onthedoc.org or hohfoundation.org. And we, we would glad to show you videos, connect you with what's going on, help you get there. But Chris, what would be some of those top issues right now you see to help t reform healthcare and to help take Liberian healthcare to that next level? What are your top issues? Well, Oh, my number one is the training of health professionals. Training, I cannot overstate that. Mm. That's lo th that's the, basic training. Mm, yeah, basic training. Is, and, uh, is is a surgeon or OB or a PA coming over? That can also be field training for people as well. So, yes. so when somebody comes up here that's highly trained, you're, you're a highly trained, uh, you were trained in Russia. We'll talk about that in the next episode. So you're, you're a trained medical physician. Anytime you can get a trained medical physician that's come from a modern country that has new technique, th that can always enhance that enhance. medical. And, and don't get me wrong, we learn from the medical people there on how to work with very little mm -hmm. and, and also sometimes how to treat things that we would never see anymore. Uh, my, dad, my dad always explains to me, he says, sounds like what you work with is what we saw when in the fifties, sixties, mm -hmm. more ringworm and, and mm -hmm. things that get kids get on the farm, scabies. you know, yeah, scabies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. There you go. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you see things like that. My dad saw when he started medical school and he was out in the rural areas, he said, you see that in Liberia because that's where Liberia is. It feels more rural. Mm -hmm. And, and we've got rid of a lot of that stuff through the school nurses and community health care. You're reestablishing that to begin to get rid of that. I, I think you're going to see some victory on that. So, t so training healthcare that would be one of your top issues. What would be your next couple? So the next will be uh, again more training. <laughs> more training <laughs> because you have the community health workers. Uh, we want to expand that program, and right now we talk about having 72 communities and villages that we work with. We have only 10 uh, community health workers. Oh, my. That's really, 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 Very really thin. Very, thin. very thin. Uh, and so that's our focus in the coming year to bring on at least another dozen so, so if you that they'll be able to they, go out. Into, they get to know one or two very well or two yes. or three, and they get to be very strong yeah, there. And to be yeah. local and to and live to local, there. Would to live there. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, people that would bring in from. And they begin to rely on villages. them. Yes. So you're really right. talking about frontline healthcare workers then. Yes. And that would really, that would do a lot to relieve. Because when we first started going to Liberia, it was like, I mean, people thought to get healthcare, they needed to go wherever they're in the country. They had to get to Monrovia. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody would go and wait at JFK for days to see what might be really, to be honest with you, a doctor fairly that, that's untrained or are out of their field, or maybe they maybe never even see a doctor, you know, mm -hmm. they would wait all that, it's been all that energy and, and might die waiting to just see the doctor. And what your suggestion is, it's all backwards. All that, to try to get everybody to come here. What you're wanting to do is put the right kind of people there. there. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that would restore so much hope and order to communities. Yeah, because, for example, the eye department we have, uh, since Kakata is centrally located, you have people coming all the way from Banga, from Nima, mm -hmm. going to Monrovia. My and, hundreds, uh, long distance instead, folks. instead, they will just make that stop in Kakata now. But right. what you're talking about care. really turns the system there upside down. Mm -hmm. and, and it, but it also seems so achievable. 
but you just need people and training. How, how do you get these, how do you get the community healthcare workers supported so they can make a living doing this? Yeah, that's uh, where we have been able for the last year, we generate uh, income from the clinic that we're able to reach out to the community health workers. You've had incredible, you've had the incredible ability to begin to build a sustainable model, almost unheard of in Liberia currently, because everything's kind of been, um, you know, I mean, people, it was supposed to be free healthcare, but it wasn't free. Uh, or people would give a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You've really created a model that, that figures out how to help people. How, how do you make, how do you go from just a, just because when Liberia came out of the Civil War, you basically had NGOs, different groups giving free care, help care, whatever. So how did you retrain people into investing in their own health care and help them uh, see value? Uh, and, and, and it may be a small amount, but the small amount when you put it together begins to form a, a net. Yeah, that's uh, that was the challenge because when we first came, because the country was so devastated, we gave everything free. Right. And so that mindset had to be change to not everything free but i saw that is something i watched you do that your your, right. your services that we provide and it took a while to get them in there but now uh, we don't even have to talk about it and know that when they come to the clinic it's children, going to be reasonable but yeah, it's going to be something reasonable. yeah zero to five years old because the, the other wasn't sustainable yeah. because uh, what we what saw happen there when I came in in ten in eight nine and ten, you saw lots of NGOs there. We were all doing work. I was one of the early NGOs, and then you saw by twenty fifteen when the hurricanes hit here and Rita and Katrina, big hurricane. Then you had another disaster somewhere else. You began to see what I called uh, NGO fatigue, donor fatigue, mm -hmm. and many of the NGOs just began to say, "Well, we're leaving Liberia." You know, Ebola brought a few of them back, mm -hmm. but as soon as Ebola was over again. Many departed because people would say, we've been helping and helping and helping and helping free, 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 free. When will the Liberians begin to fish for themselves? Mm -hmm. You came back from Russia with a degree and a medical career being from that region. And you walk in and say, we need to pay something for our health care. Mm -hmm. You were like, threw, you threw cold water on everybody. You, you, everybody was like free, free, free. And then you're a Liberian going, no, no, no. We need to do something we for ourselves. Something for ourselves. Right. And something that can outlast these people because the people mm -hmm. were starting to thin out. So you are almost a prophet. I mean, prophets are never welcome initially, but now you've got this shining city on a hill. Dental, eye, eyeglasses. You got, a, you got people cooking food. You've got community healthcare workers. You've showed that the Liberian people can help themselves. Yeah. Right, by building yeah. your own community. By building your own, own community. community. And having yeah, pride so in it. And they have pride, great yeah. pride. And, and right. I would say that's yeah. what you have been the best at, is giving people pride for what they have and their dignity. Whether it was that first clinic you had, or whether it's a clinic you have today, I, I don't find, if you go back and look, as I'm, I'm just gonna give you an example of this, okay? It won't be the best, I could do better. But if I take Dr. Hannah's picture here, this is her first clinic. You don't see trash on the ground. That was, a little clinic it's clean if you go to her place today i'm going to tell you right now i'll just show you the corridor it's clean it's, it's 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 spotless now if you leave the walls of her compound and move down into the city it's not as i know uh, i know they've done a lot of work on sanitation but it it's not near as clean no it's dirty now it's dirty and you have set you have set such an example to show respect for yourselves and the property it's that community mindset you've changed. And, and we do, saw that happen in Honduras too. We did too. Same thing when we first started going there, it was so dirty so and dirty. trashy. Mm -hmm. And and then over the years, it just started, people started so taking pride the, in their country. That's the challenges. And, you have to keep reminding them that we have to do it ourselves. Right. You can't wait for hints of hope to come and do it. Every time, that's right. right. And while we want to come, yeah. I do you think- do some things, yes. So I think the greatest good. thing we do when we come is work alongside of you guys and give you an opportunity for let us help you do cases that may be difficult, harder cases, mm -hmm. training, walk, working alongside your workers and just having the time to say, hey, let us carry the water with you for a season and, and, and let us show you technique, let us learn technique from you and, and let us leave as much resources as we can with you. I, I think the key is the, 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 the comradeship that we build when we work together.
And I think it's great that we can see a thousand patients. I, I think that, that, that to God be glorified. But I think the best thing is we get to work with you while we see a thousand patients. Yeah. And I think we are stronger that way. So mm -hmm. I look forward to getting back there because number one, I know your system's even better. I also know we'll be able to be more efficient because your, your ability to put the right people that we can treat will be even better. So I know it's going to be better. So if you're if you're out there, please pay attention to Hands Up Foundation. Get, get, go subscribe to Hands Up Foundation's uh, Facebook site. Watch for you know when we get ready to set up the next trip. Same thing with Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. Find out how you can help them. It's just just amazing. Or like you said, you can also arrange for people to go down. Yeah, individually. Yeah, yeah we're glad to help you. Help. We will help. help you. Go to info at on the doctor.org. We'll help you. If you're a doctor, surgeon, uh, OBGYN, you're retired, you're still practicing, you want to just go and serve a couple weeks. Uh, Get a hold of us, and we'll get you in contact with Dr. Hannah, right. and we'll work through the process. Yeah, when they come, uh, they'll have a place to stay. That, excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. Are you working on it? I love that. Yeah. Well, have I you worked on your guest house? Is it, is it? It's completed. It is completed. Oh. I was when I saw your guest house, it was it was just in the beginning phases. Yeah, it's completed. I cannot wait to come. I so, am looking for Dr. Hannah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come back and see you real soon. Hey, we're going to wrap up this episode. I'm going to get Dr. Hannah back in the studio for what I think is going to be maybe one of the most incredible things. But let me say in Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. Dr. Chris Hannah, Medical Director, Post Office Box 816, Wakahatchee, right? Waxahachie. Waxahachie. This is a better than I do. Texas, 75168. <laughs> you you can get information from them. Send them a check, whatever. But go to Facebook. Check out their at Healthy Women Liberia site. Go to the website, healthywomenliberia.org. Find out how you can be a part, how you can see the, more about this vision. And you can always email them for questions. And we would love to hear back from you. And when we get into part three of this, we're going to bring her back in. And, and let, me, let me tell you what we're going to do here. Let me get the right part three screen up. Part three, we're going to look at Dr. Chris Henna's story. And it is honestly, she got inspired to be a doctor uh, by a by a child by a childhood friend who 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 did she die from the myelitis? She died. Yes. She died, and that sends her on a journey. And you will not believe how and who educates her to be who she is, That's and and, incredible. and 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 how the Christian community uh, came in and out. It was something. It's something. Your story is something out of the Book of Acts. So you are in my book. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read, uh, anybody out there ever read, my, one of my favorite books, if you want to find the name of the book, you can go to communityfaithchurch.org. Uh, that's my website, uh, cofchurch.org. Or you, you might can find it on our on the doc, but you can find my bio. M one of my three favorite books is Father Arseny, uh, priest, uh, uh, prisoner. And it's Father Arseny was a uh, Russian Orthodox uh, priest. And it tells the story of Father Arseny. And it's his personal memoirs. And, and it's incredible, incredible, incredible thing. And he was just somebody that God just touched and had a hand on in his work. You are somebody like that that God's had his hand on. And uh, when I read, when I, when I hear your life story, I, I think of Father Austin. And he, and it, it, behind the Iron Curtain. I think of my, my, my father in the Lord, Fred, Reverend Fred Bishop, who spent a lot of time behind the Iron Curtain. So um, we look forward to getting you back for episode number three, Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. Dr. Chris Hannah's story, we're going to get you back in the studio for, for that. And we're looking forward to that. So I hope others will join us. We just want to remind you, uh, by the way, you can find On The Doc at onthedoc.org. You can find us at all our platforms at YouTube, uh, iTunes, and Spotify. Also Google Play, Facebook, Roku, Rumble, and SermonNet. And check us out on all of our social media partners. We'd love to hear from you at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, and Gatter nowadays. And hit the subscribe, hit the like, hit the notify. We'd love to hear from you that way. And we would always love to have you as a partner or subscriber, a partner or sponsor on our Patreon site. Check out our various tiers of support there. We'd love to have you. You can either be a sponsor to the program or you can become a partner and you can find out all this information. If you've heard something today you wanted, you want more information, you can email us at info at on the doc.org and you can always find all of our platforms, all of our links at on the doc.org. Mother Beth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for letting you, me be here. Yeah, you did better. You did better <laughs> in this episode. And Dr. Henna, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. We're going to let her get some rest, and then we're going to get her back in here, and we're going to hear this incredible story of her life, and we'll be back in the next part of Healthy Women, Healthy Library Part 3. So thank, thank you for joining us here on The Doc. Look forward to seeing you soon. Check out our other episodes. You can go back, find those at onthedoc.org. Go back and check out our other episodes in our various series, and we look forward to bringing you more in the future. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pastor Troy. On the Doc.